Copper Sun by Sharon Draper, Chapter 22, Lashed with a Whip. When Polly and Amari returned to Teeny's kitchen, both of them clearly upset, Teeny didn't seem the least bit surprised. How's Hildy, she asked as she pulled Tidbit close to her. Cato said, told us she might die, Polly reported, tucking her shaking hands under her arms. Then she asked, how'd you know? I declare, child, you ought to know by now that it don't take long for news to travel around here, Teeny said. So did Cato also scare you about how gals like mine here be ended up in, in the rice fields? Polly nodded and frowned. This time last year, she was back in Beaufort with her folks. She wouldn't have given a second thought to a slave being going to work in the rice fields. That's what a slave was supposed to do. Who cared about the feelings of an ignorant slave anyway? But this was someone she knew, maybe even felt sorry for. Somehow, that made a difference. Cato speaks true, Tina said calmly, solemnly. But I got an idea. Let's see what we can do. The two of you go back and wash yourself. Get ready. Get back in here real quick, like. The two girls returned with clean faces and hands, and Teeny handed them each an outfit worn by the house serving maids. Flora, one of the serving gals, is Hildy's daughter. She done run down there to see her mama, Teeny explained. Massa don't allow such behavior, but he don't know yet. So you two gonna take her place at supper. Ali and Amari exchanged looks of surprise. Polly, you just do what Lena, the head serving gal, tells you to do. Say nothing except for yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Mina, you copy everything they do and act like you don't know what you're doing, and act like you know what you're doing. You understand in all this, gal? Polly was pleased that Amari replied that she had been, as she had been taught. Yes, Teeny, but she was thrilled about the chance to work in the big house. Finally. Teeny looked worried, however. Don't you drop nothing here. Now get, she told them. Polly changed quickly into the stiff black uniform, inwardly praying that perhaps this would be the start of her move up to the main house and out of the kitchen with the slaves. She then hoped Amari helped Amari tie the sash on her apron. Tidbit laughed out loud when he saw the two girls dressed as maids. Polly shooed him away. Have you seen Mr. Derby since the first day we arrived here? She asked Amari as they prepared to take the food to the main house. Amari shook her head. Not seen, which be good. Have you ever been inside the main house, Polly asked. Then she gasped as she realized what Amari's answer would be. Only nighttime, Amari replied harshly. Oh, Mina, I forgot. I not forget, Amari st stated, her voice sharp as broken glass. Do you think Mrs. Derby knows what Clay is doing? She know, Amari ang said angrily. Maybe she can help you, Polly offered tentatively. She seems to be very pleasant. She need help herself, Amari replied sharply. Polly tried to tried to understand, but she couldn't truly fathom the depths of Mina's apparent distress. Slave, slave women were always called to the bedrooms of their masters. It was simply a, a fact of life. Mina should understand that by now and be getting used to it. But she let the subject drop as they prepared to carry the food. Amari took a platter of venison, while Polly carried a huge glistening corn pone on another large platter. They walked carefully up the path from the kitchen to the big house and entered through the back door. Lena took one look at the two girls and rolled her eyes up to the ceiling. Lord have mercy, we are gonna get in trouble for sure. Tell Teeny if I gets a beating over this, I ain't ever forgiven her. Now go back and bring the rest of the food. Polly and Amari dashed back several more times to get the rest of the food for supper for Mr. Derby and his wife. All of it was laid out on, on a sideboard to be served as Lena directed. Polly looked around the room in rapt curiosity. Now this is where I belong, she thought with a smile, taking in the dark green curtains covering the window to keep out the afternoon heat, the fine green, pale green embroidered cop carpet decorating each flo floor, and the pictures of ancient derby relatives lining the walls. Fancy silver eating and drinking utensils lay in a huge cupboard on the other side of the room. Polly had never seen such finery. Oh, how Mama would have loved this, she thought. Polly tiptoed to peek in the adjoining room, which was obviously Mr. Derby's study. She inhaled with pleasure. Shelves of leather-bound books filled one wall. She gave, she'd gave. she give anything to simply touch them. To have access to them would be heaven. Her mother had taught her to read using the Bible and occasional pieces of newsprint that came their way. But Polly longed for the books of her own. If I could get assigned to the main house, she thought, I would sneak into this room during every free moment. She retired. She sighed and returned to the dining room. 
Standing silently near the door of the dining room and almost like a statue was the coachman who had driven the two girls here from the market just a few months ago. Once again, he was dressed in an elegant coat and a shirt with lace cuffs. This here is Noah, Leona explained. Noah nodded silently, but continued to stand stiffly and formally. He's the coachman, the butler, Miss Isabel's bodyguard, and probably the fanciest house slave you got, we got around here. Best looking, too, Lena laughed. Massa trusts him, and she lowered her voice to a whisper. Where it is that Miss Isabel then taught him how to read? He suddenly, Lena cleared her throat and snapped to attention. Polly and Amari did the same. Mr. Derby, dressed in a red velvet suit, escorted his now very pregnant wife into the room. Clay sauntered in behind them, gave a look of undisguised disgust to his stepmother and sat as far away from her as he could. He seemed to be trying to get Amari's attention, Polly thought, but Amari had dropped her head and refused to look at him. Where's Flora? Mr. Derby demanded as soon as he had helped his wife be seated. Her mama got snake bit today, sir, real bad. She done run to the quarters to see her, Lena explained quickly. But we got something special for your supper today. Yes, we do. Polly, pour the wine like I showed you. Polly hurried, hurried to obey. Well, I hope she's not too badly injured, Mr. Derby said irritably. I hate it when my workers are laid up. Mrs. Derby spoke up, although barely audible. Shall I check on her tomorrow, Percival? No, my dear. I really disapprove of you dealing with the servants. It's not wise in your condition, you know. She might need medical attention. Mrs. Derby suggested softly. I'm sure she'll be fine, her husband said. It is you I worry about, Isabel. Right now, the most important thing on things on my mind are your happiness and comfort, he said firmly, and the safety of our child. I could never forgive myself if anything happened to that baby. I have never been, I have not been this excited or this happy in many years. He took his hand, her hand in his. It seemed to Polly that he gazed at his wife with genuine concern. Mrs. Derby smiled at him, touched her belly, and let the matter drop. Turning to Clay, Mr. Derby said, Son, run down to the quarters tomorrow and get one of the slaves from the fishing gang to take her place. It will be my pleasure, Father, the young boy replied lazily. But why not just send Noah? He's able-bodied, perfectly good waste of a strong worker, seems to me. Polly saw Clay look at his stepmother with a wicked grin. Isabel Derby inhaled, then looked at her husband in alarm. You promised, Percival, you promised when we married that I could keep my bodyguard. Mr. Percival's face, Mr. Derby's face softened as he put his arm around his wife's shoulders and gave, gave her what seemed to be a reassuring hug. I think Clay is merely teasing you, my dear. I would, wouldn't think of upsetting you by doing such a thing. All I care about right now is your health and your happiness. To Clay, he said, try to be kinder, son. You'll have a brother or sister soon. Clay rolled his eyes, looked at Miss, Mrs. Derby with disdain, and drank another glass of wine. It was clear to Polly that he truly disliked his mother. As they continued to serve the food, Amari looked nervous, so Polly said to, so Polly tried to help whenever she thought Amari might not understand the command. She wasn't going to let Amari spoil her chances to impress the Derbys. Noah continued to stand like a sentry at the door, never moving, never displaying any emotion. Mrs. Derby drank very little of the white wine that Amari had carefully poured for her. She had given Amari a pleasant smile, however, and had thanked her as Amari deftly slipped a, a white linen napkin onto Miss, Mrs. Derby's lap. You must eat more, my dear Isabel, Mr. Derby said to his wife. You want our child to be healthy, don't you? She looked up nervously. Yes, of course, you're right, Percival, she replied. She motioned to Polly to put a little more cone pone on her plate, but Polly noticed she only nibbled at it. Please tell Teeny the supper is delicious, Mrs. Derby said to Lena. Now, don't comp compliment the slaves in doing their jobs, my dear. Your kindness only makes them weak and careless. It sounded to Polly that Mr. Derby admonished his, admonished his wife almost as if he were speaking to a child, but he also seemed to dote on her. He touched her constantly, fixing a ringlet of her hair that had fallen into her face, brushing a speck from her shawl, and patting her right hand with his, with his right. As Lena skillfully served the stew, venison, corn, and beans to the Derby family, Amari and Polly were kept busy taking plates back to the kitchen, bringing up steaming baskets of bread, and finally a fresh-baked blackberry pie. Mrs. Derby continued to pick at her food, and her husband sometimes stopped his conversation with Clay to cut a small piece of meat for his wife so she would eat it. Now, don't you feel better, he would say, after she had swallowed it. She would smile wanly. And 
in agreement. It seemed to Polly that he treated his wife more like a delicate possession than a real person. Any genuine conversation he seemed to save for his son. I'm thinking we can bring in a few more slaves, he told Clay. The rice crop will do well this year and the market has gone up. Let's plan on making a bigger harvest next season. Clay nodded, casting in another glance at Amari. That means expanding the river fields by the river. We'll need fresh Africans for that. They know rice so well. How many do you think, his father asked. Three or four at least, Clay replied. They don't seem to last long out there. Well, I'll keep my eyes open the next time I go to market, Mr. Derby said. We best be getting them soon so they can be broken in by planting time. They speak about buying slaves the same way they discuss the purchase of cattle or supplies, Polly noticed, surprised at how uncomfortable that made her feel. When I am the mistress of such a place, I will discuss the purchase of people. When I am the mistress of such a place, will I discuss the purchase of people as they do? She was not sure of the answer. Do you think we'll need to sell any slaves to get money for next year's supplies, Clay asked his father. Not this season, son. I've monitored the books quite closely, and I think this year we will make quite a profit without selling any property. He seemed pleased. Property? They call the slaves property. Polly thought about the slaves she had come to know since she had come to the plantation. The thought of one of them being sold distressed her in a way she had not thought possible. Without Amari and Teeny and Tidbit, how awful it would be here, Polly suddenly realized. Clay stopped to scratch his head, then said to his father, I hear talk in town of folks in the North starting to, to speak about ending slavery. Mr. Derby, sipping his third glass of wine, snorted. That will never happen. Those norther Northerners, they can't even grow the rice they love so much. They know nothing about a, how a business is run. Rice, tobacco, corn, where do you think it comes from? Clay, who had had even more wine than his father, leaned back on the two back legs of his chair carelessly. Slavery just makes good sense to me. Anyway, our slaves are better off here than in some jungle eating bugs and slugs like savages. Of course they are. They need us, son. Mr. Derby is right, isn't he? Living here has got to be better than a jungle, right? Polly wasn't so wasn't sure anymore. She could see Lena grinding her teeth in anger. She glanced over at Amari to see her reaction, but Amari stared straight ahead. Isabel Derby sat pale and quiet, her eyes cast down through most of the meal. It was as it was as if she were one of the many room decorations. Unhappiness seemed to ooze from her like perspiration on a humid day. Polly shook her head as she realized that being a fine lady didn't necessarily, necessarily mean finding joy. Clay's antagonism toward Mrs. Derby was almost palpable. He glared at her every time she picked up a spoon or wiped her lips with a linen napkin. Finally, the meal was over and the last of the dishes were being removed. Polly, relieved that neither she nor Amari had done anything to call, call negative attention to themselves, congratulated herself on a successful evening. I'm going to speak to Mrs. Derby right after dinner, Polly bow, bowed bravely. This might be my only chance. I will offer my service to her as personal assistant. Surely with the new baby, she will need someone to help her. Mr. Derby finished a last glass of wine, then lit his pipe and stretched his long legs out from his chair, just as Amari was walking by with the final platter of leftover blackberry pie. Amari, looking at Polly rather than the floor, tripped over his legs and fell. No, no, Polly breathed as the platter. Platter flipped and the pie creamed to the floor. Purple red berries splattered onto the carpet, pale carpet. There was a moment of absolute silence. Amari cowered on the floor in obvious terror. Polly too, Polly, too afraid to breathe, waited for the thunderous voice of the master. You stupid black wench, he roared. Lena, get my whip. Polly gasped at the mo same moment as Amari did. Polly knew Lena had no choice but to obey. She returned quickly and had an, handed it to Mr. Derby, never looking at him directly. Coiled like a snake, the whip was made of leather. The, lash, the tip of the lash was laced with wire. Polly inhaled and held her breath. Mr. Derby gasped, grasped the handle, drew his arm back, and fiercely brought the braided lash on it across Amari's back. She screamed, twisting with pain at his feet. Again, he beat her. And again, seven times he thrashed her, 10, 12. The back of her new housemaid uniform was ripped to shreds, stained with her blood. Polly clenched her hands into fists, furious at being so helpless and angry at her own selfishness as well. Because even though she flinched every time Amari was hit, she couldn't help but realize that this incident 
incident would forever ruin her chances of working in the main house. Lena quietly murmured words of prayer. Horror distorted Mrs. Derby's face. Clay looked surprisingly uncomfortable and agitated. Only Noah never changed his stance or facial expression. Finally, Isabel Derby got up from the table and walked over to her husband. Noticeably trembling, she grabbed his hand as he lifted it to strike Amari again. Enough, she said quietly. The girl has learned her lesson. Make her clean up the mess and let her be. It is distressing to me to see such a scene. It might mar our child. Mr. Derby, as if returning from another place, shook his head and coiled the whip. You are right, my dear, he told her. He took a deep breath. To Polly, he said, I put you in charge of this ignorant African. You have failed me. It is your fault she made such a fool of herself tonight. Clean the floor, then tend to her wounds. As soon as she's healed, she goes to the rice fields to replace Hildy. Polly bowed her head and murmured apologies that she knew Mr. Derby would not hear. She dared to look at Amari, who lay still, who lay deathly still, and at the carpet, stained with both blood and pie. Polly wasn't sure what to do first. She had never been so scared in her life. Mr. Derby escorted his wife out of the room then. Clay, looking quite distressed, gazed at the bleeding and unconscious Amari for a long time before following after them. Noah slowly left the room as well, as his job was protector of the master and his wife. Vinegar, he whispered as he headed out the door. Vinegar will remove the stains from the carpet.